a una persona que no solamente sus libros han revolucionado a la humanidad. Steven Pinker tiene los estudios más profundos del lenguaje, de la mente, y yo iba a hablar de la violencia. Steven Pinker, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all of us read about the wars and murders in the news. We shake our heads and we say to ourselves, what is the world coming to? Uh, but how many of us really know whether the world is a more or less dangerous place today than it used to be? Well, I asked a sample of people a number of questions about the history of violence such as, which was more lethal, tribal warfare or 20th century warfare? Medieval England or modern England? War in the 1950s or war in the 2000s? America in the... Oh, just, just one question. Por favor, el volumen, hay algún problema de... de uh, oh, there's a problem. They, they have a little pretty big problem. If we could start again. Just okay. one second, please. Could you try it? One, two, three. Oh, yes. One, two, three. Can Escucha you hear me? Bien. Is that better? Should I start from the beginning? Please, they will give you a microphone. Is that okay? Oh, okay. Thank you. Quítale el otro. Yes, if you could start again, I'm sorry. I start from the beginning? Okay. We all... How's this? Can you hear me? No, still no. Oh, oh, I'm supposed to use this. Okay, that's right. Okay. We all read about the wars and murders in the news. We're likely to shake our heads and say, what is the world coming to? But how many of us really have a clear sense as to whether the world of today is a more or less violent place than the world of yesterday? Well, I asked a number of people, uh, uh, which was more lethal, tribal warfare or 20th century warfare? Medieval England or modern England? War in the 1950s or war in the 2000s? America in the 1970s or America in the 2000s? Now, in every case, people guessed that the period closer to the present was the more violent period, anywhere from about 15% more violent to almost four times more violent. In every one of these cases, we actually have data, and in, in fact, the past was more violent than the present in every case, and by a lot. Contrary to popular opinion, Violence has been in decline for long stretches of time, and today we are probably living in the most peaceful time in our species' existence. I'm going to try to convince you of this astonishing fact by reviewing six major declines of, of violence, their immediate causes in terms of uh, the preceding history, and their ultimate causes in terms of human psychology. I'm going to start with a decline of violence that I call the pacification process. Until 5,000 years ago, humans lived in a state of anarchy without central government. What was life like in a state of nature? This is an ancient question. Jean-Jacques Rousseau famously said that nothing can be more gentle than man in his primitive state. And Thomas Hobbes, equally famously, said that the life of man in a state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, whoops, here we go. This shows the rate of death in warfare in a number of uh, pre-state societies. The average is about 500 war deaths per 100,000 people per year. Uh, and the small black bars correspond to the most violent countries in the most violent periods of history in the modern West. Uh, this is the average for 27 pre-state societies. This is Japan in the 20th century, Germany in the 20th century, Russia in the 20th century. This is the rate for the entire 20th century, including all the deaths in wars, genocides, and uh, tyranny. Uh, you can't see the bar for the rate of death in warfare for the entire world in 2005 because it's uh, so, so small. So not to put too fine a point on it, but when it comes to life in a state of nature, Hobbes was right, Rousseau was wrong. What was the uh, cause? Well, the immediate cause was probably the rise and expansion of states. When you 
take history, you learn about the Pax Romana, the Pax Islamica, the Pax Hispanica, peace imposed by uh, imperial powers. The reason is that tribal raiding and feuding uh, is a nuisance to imperial overlords for the same reason that a farmer doesn't want its cattle to, to kill each other. He'd rather have them alive. Likewise, in, uh, emperors would rather their, their subject peoples not engage in internecine fighting that is just a dead loss for him. The uh, second decline of violence can be illustrated by this uh, woodcut of what life was like in the Middle Ages in Europe. Uh, Manuel Eisner and other criminologists have looked at homicide data for the last 700 years. And they've shown that, to everyone's surprise, the rate of homicide in Europe has declined from about 30 per 100,000 per year down to about 1 per 100,000 per year between the Middle Ages and the present. Uh, just for comparison, uh, here we have the rate for all of the non-state societies. This is the rate for the United States, which is more violent than Europe, but still far more less violent than Europe in the Middle Ages. Mexico has an high, even higher homicide rate, but even then it is lower than what the rate was in the Middle Ages in Europe, to say nothing of non-state societies. What were the causes? Well, according to Norbert Elias in his classic book, The Civilizing Process, the main cause was that in the transition from Middle Ages to modernity, one saw a consolidation of central states and kingdoms, criminal justice was nationalized, and the, in place of warlords and vendettas and feuds, you had the king's justice. Also, the Middle Ages saw a growing infrastructure of commerce, the rise of money and finance, of technologies of trans transportation and timekeeping. And so there was a replacement from zero-sum plunder to positive-sum trade. Other people were more valuable alive than dead. The third decline of violence I call the humanitarian revolution. And it can be illustrated by some of the methods of criminal punishment in the Middle Ages, such as breaking on the wheel, burning at the stake, sawing in half, uh, impalement, and clawing. All of these barbaric uh, practices were eliminated in a narrow slice of time around the uh, European Enlightenment in the 18th century. Uh, this graph shows the countries that eliminated judicial torture. Here uh, we have a, uh, I'm going to show you a graph for the use of the death penalty for nonviolent crimes. In the United States, for example, in the 17th and 18th century, the death penalty was used for crimes such as theft, sodomy, buggery, bestiality, adultery, witchcraft, arson, concealing birth, burglary, slave revolt, counterfeiting, and horse theft. But over the centuries, the number of capital crimes has decreased so that today only murder and conspiracy to commit murder are punishable by death. And of course, in many other countries, the death penalty has been eliminated altogether. And of course, the Enlightenment also saw the initiation of the movement to abolish slavery. What were the immediate causes of the humanitarian revolution? I think the most likely one was the rise of printing and literacy. This graph shows the number of books published in England uh, between the 1400s and the 1800s, which took off just before the uh, Age of Enlightenment. And more people were literate and were able to consume these books. Why should literacy matter? Well, knowledge replaced superstition and ignorance. As Voltaire famously said, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Also, the cosmopolitanism encouraged by literacy uh, led people to read fiction, history, and journalism. People got into the habit of inhabiting other people's minds, which cultivated their sense of empathy and led to less cruelty. The uh, fourth decline of violence has been called the Long Peace, uh, and it refers to the period since World War II. Now, many people say that the 20th century inaugurated a new era of violence, uh, and it's true that the Second World War was the deadliest event in human history in terms of absolute numbers. On the other hand, the world had a lot more people in the 20th century than it had in previous centuries. 
And in fact, World War II is not the most deadly event in terms of the proportion of the world's population that was killed. Uh, here we have a uh, graph of the rate of death in various violent events from 500 BC to 2000. This is courtesy of Matthew White. And it is certainly true that World War II and World War I were very violent events, but they certainly were not the most violent events in human history. And if one zooms in on the time scale, one sees that indeed World War II caused a massive spike in uh, deaths in warfare, but there has been a precipitous decline ever since, and it did not usher in a new era of permanent violence. The long piece is, refers to the remarkable historical development since 1946, in which there have been zero wars between the two Cold War superpowers, contrary to everyone's prediction. No nuclear weapon has been used in warfare since Nagasaki. There have been no wars between great powers since 1953. No wars between Western European countries, a fact that we take for granted until we remember that before 1945, there was an average of two new wars per year breaking out in Western Europe. And in fact, no wars between developed countries at all, a historically unprecedented development. Well, what was happening in the rest of the world uh, while the European and developed countries stopped going to war? Uh, since 1946, there have been far fewer interstate wars, but there have been more civil wars. However, even the number of civil wars declined since 1991. This is a graph that shows the number of wars of each type, and you can see uh, a, a large bulge. It's an area graph, so the thickness of each patch represents the number of wars. And indeed, there was an increase in the number of civil wars and then a decrease after 1991. Well, this just raises the question, what kind of war kills more people? And the answer is clear. By far, wars between countries kill more people than wars within countries. This is a graph from the 1950s. This bar is a number of deaths in a typical war between countries. This is the number of deaths in a typical civil war. And in the ensuing decades, the 1960s, 1970s, 80s, 90s, and, 90, and, and um, 2000s, uh, even the rate of death in interstate war has gone down. If you put them together, the number of deaths per war and the number of wars, you see there has been a, a bumpy but unmistakable decline in the number of deaths from all wars. And so in the current decade, we have an unprecedentedly low rate of death in all kinds of war. The immediate causes were anticipated by Immanuel Kant in the 18th century in his essay, Perpetual Peace, where he proposed that democracy, trade, and an international community were forces of stable peace. Recently, the political scientists Bruce Russett and John O'Neill have confirmed each of Kant's three causes. Democracy has been, in, uh, uh, has been increasing steadily since the end of the Second World War. Trade has shown an enormous takeoff, and uh, membership in intergovernmental organizations, the United Nations, the European Union, and so on. Uh, a second kind of international community comes from peacekeeping, and we can also see there has been an enormous increase in the number of United Nations and other peacekeeping forces, which have succeeded in reducing the rate of death in warfare. The uh, final decline of violence I call the rights revolutions, and this pertains to violence against vulnerable groups such as racial minorities, women, children, and animals. The civil rights movement, for example, in the United States saw a precipitous decline in the rate of lynching through the 20th century. And much more recently, even since the 1990s, there has been a decline in all kinds of hate crimes against African Americans. The women's rights movement has seen a decline uh, in rape of 80% since 1980 and a decline in domestic violence. The movement for children's rights has taken corporal punishment, paddling and birching and other forms of beating children uh, out of the schools. It used to be in the United States that every state allowed teachers to beat students, now fewer than half do. There's been a decline in child abuse since the 1990s. 
and a decline in school violence, such as uh, fights and bullying. Uh, finally, the animal rights movement has seen a decline in hunting. The number of, of uh, hunters has gone down. The number of vegetarians has gone up. And the number of motion pictures in which animals were harmed uh, has gone down. Now the question is, why has violence declined? Well, one possibility is that humans have lost their inclinations toward violence. We have become a kinder, gentler species. Well, I think this is an unlikely explanation. For one thing, people have not lost any of their taste for consuming simulated violence or vicarious violence, such as in murder mysteries, Greek tragedies, Shakespearean dramas, Mel Gibson movies, video games, and hockey. Uh, also, people are prone to homicidal fantasies. Uh, David Buss, whom we heard from this morning, uh, and David Kenrick each did surveys asking people, have you ever fantasized about killing someone you don't like? And the results are uh, interesting. 75% of men at least occasionally fantasize about killing someone they don't like. 62% of women have ho homicidal fantasies, and the rest of them are lying. A more likely possibility is that human nature comprises inclinations toward violence and inclinations that counteract them, what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. And over the course of history, circumstances have increasingly favored our peaceable inclinations. So the question is, which historical developments bring out our better angels? Uh, I think one of them is the Leviathan that uh, Hobbes got it right when he proposed that a state with a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence can circumvent the temptation of exploitative attack, the impulsive thirst for revenge, and self-serving biases that make all sides always believe that they're on the side of the angels. Examples of the pacifying effects of the Leviathan are the pacification and civilization process where the consolidation of states uh, tangibly brought down rates of violence in pre-state and medieval societies, and the fact that when violence does erupt today, it tends to be in zones of anarchy, the American Wild West, failed states, collapsed empires, uh, mafias, street gangs, and, uh, the, uh, and to some extent the border regions of uh, uh, Mexico. A second historical force that has driven violence down is uh, gentle commerce, the idea that trade is a positive sum game where everyone, everybody wins, and that as technology has improved, it has allowed the trade of goods and ideas across longer distances among larger groups of people at lower cost, the process that Matt Ridley spoke about this morning. So other people become more valuable alive than dead, as the journalist Robert Wright put it, among the many reasons that I think we should not bomb the Japanese is that they built my minivan. Uh, then there's a force that Peter Singer uh, called the expanding circle, picking up on an idea from Charles Darwin, namely that evolution bequeathed us with a sense of empathy, an ability to treat other people's interests as equivalent to our own. Unfortunately, by default, we apply it to a narrow circle of friends and family. However, over the course of history, the circle has expanded from the village to the clan to the tribe to the nation to other races, both sexes, children, and perhaps ultimately other species. What has expanded the circle? I've mentioned one possibility, namely the inducements for perspective taking from history, novels, journalism, and travel. Evidence that this may have taken place was the fact that the humanitarian revolution was preceded by what has been called the Republic of Letters, the rise of literacy and correspondence and books in the 17th and 18th century, and that the second half of the 20th century, the era of the long peace and the rights revolutions, was also the era of Marshall McLuhan's global village uh, brought together by electronic media. Finally, I think a historical force that reduces violence is the escalator of reason, that as literacy, education, and public discourse have expanded, people are more likely to recognize the futility of cycles of violence. It makes it harder to privilege their own interests over others and uh, subject people to exploitation and predation. And 
it replaces a morality based on tribalism, authority, and puritanism with a morality based on fairness and universal rules. And it reframes violence from a problem to be solved into a, uh, uh, sorry, from a contest to be won into a problem to be solved. All the processes that we call enlightenment. Well, I think the decline of violence has profound implications. It calls on us to reassess modernity, that is, the forces of individualism, reason, science, technology, secularism, and cosmopolitanism. Everyone acknowledges that modernity has brought us longer and healthier lives, less ignorance and superstition, richer experiences, again as Matt Ridley reminded us this morning, but some people question the price. Is it worth it to have an iPhone if the price is an increase in muggings, school shootings, terrorism, holocausts, world wars, gulags, and nuclear weapons? But if in fact the impression of an increase in violence is, a, is an illusion, that in fact the long-term trend, though halting and incomplete, is that violence of all kinds is decreasing, I think it calls for a rehabilitation of the concept of modernity and progress, a cause for guarded, indeed rational optimism, and a reason to cherish the forces of civilization and enlightenment that have made it possible. Thank you very much.